morning everybody and welcome to our Wellness for All webinar where today we'll be talking about the subject of suicide on World Suicide Prevention Day. It might feel like that this is something different, a different subject than we'd normally uh, be talking about. But when we think about courageous conversations, thoughts of suicide can occur when people have problems in any areas of their, on their lives, and therefore any of our eight domains in our wellness charter. We need to be alert to the possibility that that could be the case. And perhaps as many as one in 20 people at any time could be thinking or have suicidal thoughts. On World Suicide Prevention Day, we've therefore invited Simon Richardson back from Golden Tree to help us explore this very sensitive subject. During the webinar, Simon will interview Jeremy, excuse me, Jeremy O'Dwyer, who now runs his own business. He looks at raising awareness of mental health and suicide prevention. We'll explore the events leading up to and following his own suicide attempt. Now we appreciate that this is an extremely sensitive subject and we'd encourage anybody who feels that they need help to reach out to their GP, the Samaritans, or perhaps our employee assistance program, We Care. There is a wealth of support out there and available to you. So please reach out if you need to. So let's have a look at our speakers for today. Well, Simon, we know he's part of our sewers family. Uh, and he now calls himself an accomplished public speaker on the subject of emotional health and well-being. And of course he is. He's got over 25 years of experience in the health and education sectors and extensive experience in counselling and facilitating positive approaches to physical and mental health. Morning, him, morning Simon. With him is Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy is a director and trainer with Talking Mental Fitness. Jeremy worked in the manufacturing industry for 20 years before working in business support as a health and safety advisor within the police service. And as I've just mentioned, he now runs his own business, raising awareness of mental health and suicide prevention. Thank you, Jeremy, for agreeing to join us today. It is a sensitive subject. and I commend your courageousness in sharing your story with us today. We feel privileged to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, well, morning, Jeremy. It's it's lovely to, to see you. Um, I just want to just say what we were up to last night. So I'll just ask, what were you up to last night? Uh, well, morning, Simon. Uh, as you know, today is World Suicide Prevention Day and um, some local community organisations in Warrington organised a darkness into light walk where people left witness around about half past two this morning and walked to Warrington and had shared a burger, a cup of coffee and listened to a few speakers um, in a way marking the day um, and what was fantastic about the event was that over 250 people did that walk from Witness to Warrington and the idea is that it shows people that no matter how dark their lives might be there is hope and be attracted to that light so the idea was set off in darkness and arrive just as it was getting light a really powerful and um, emotive night so uh, forgive me if I do the occasional yawn no sleep last night but I'm, feeling I'm feeling refreshed thank you I mean, thank you for coming from straight from that and, and pretty much on, on on to this now we've known each other about six years haven't we Jeremy we, we first met as, as you were doing some a talk not unlike this to a group of people that were training in Sort of mental health first aid or first aid for mental health kind of uh, approaches. It's a really powerful talk that I'm going to hand over to you in a moment and, and I just want to kind of 
highlight again, just reinforce the message, and I'm sure you would endorse this, that if people are kind of moved by your talk and then it's triggering something in them, that they do reach out and have the conversation with someone, either their, their employee assistance programme, through we care or, or going to the GP or even just talking to family members and, and friends just about how they're feeling. So it's massively important that people have the confidence to be able to do that because uh, it's a way of actually potentially disarming a suicide plan and moving somebody from a place of crisis into a place of safety. That's, that's super. I think that's something that we'll kind of think about as, as we go through this and think about maybe what we can do. Because I know it features on a lot of the training that both you and I do now, moving that person from crisis to, to safety. But I just want to hand over to you now, Jeremy, and uh, I'll stay on screen because um, I want to, to, to hear you as, as, as well. Um, over to you. T tell us your story. Okay. What happened to you? Okay. Um, well, I'm 61 years old. I've been married to Michelle now for 29 years, and we've got two sons, Daniel and Kieran, and they are 25 and 22 years old, respectively. There was nothing in my upbringing to suggest that I was going to be uh, susceptible to mental illness. And when I left college, I started working for a company that manufactured machines for the shoe industry. And uh, I spent many, many years traveling the world at their expense, selling the machines. And uh, for a young lad, an amazing experience and, and one I am grateful for. But my working pattern was six weeks abroad and 10 days at home. And that working pattern carried on for a long, long time. And what strikes me when I think back is that, do you know what? I think I was impacted by loneliness. You know, you, it doesn't matter what country you're in, you can be in a, in a hotel in America or a hotel in Africa. When you're sitting there in a hotel bar night after night, yeah. And it became a very lonely world for me. I mentioned that because I think that was one of the contributory factors to me um, sinking into depression. I was also made redundant after working for that company for 20 years. Um, the redundancy came as a, a massive shock and um, it took me a long time to get new employment um, but again it had a massive impact on my mental state and I could feel myself becoming more and more withdrawn, more and more anxious, depressed, I, mean, I knew the signs. Um, I didn't need the doctor's diagnosis. But I suppose I'm a very stubborn individual, probably was then, um, and it was not a manly thing to do to admit to being mentally unwell. Um, I worked in a very male orientated environment, and to admit uh, being ill would have been seen as being weak, a bit of a snowflake, if you'll pardon the expression. So I actually hid my depression from, from everybody. I even hid it from Michelle because I was just so ashamed uh, that I should feel like that. And I was also acutely aware of the stigma surrounding um, mental illness. Not telling Michelle actually caused a lot of damage, I think, because I had to put a huge amount of effort into hiding and masking the symptoms. And all the time, my mental state was deteriorating and um, thoughts of suicide surfaced, um, wanting the pain to stop, um, feeling worthless, feeling that people would be better off without me. And I put a lot of effort into thinking about how I might kill myself, the method that I would use. And I, over the months, I thought about them all, some of the violent ones and some of the less violent ones. And I did settle on the fact that when my time came, I would take an overdose, um, alcohol and uh, medication. The um, three parts to a suicide plan, in my opinion, 
there is the method, the time, and the place. So I had decided on the, the method, but the, the timing was um, spontaneous. I had a particularly bad day at work, but when I look back at it, was it really that bad? No, not really, but I was just in a very bad place and probably over exaggerated my emotions and feelings. But the result was I decided that that was a day I was going to go and kill myself. And that was my intention when I left work. Um, I went to the supermarket and bought all the alcohol that I was going to need and then drove off to a quiet place um, where I then started to overdose on the antidepressants and the alcohol. I do actually count myself very, very lucky because I was actually found in time by the police. But in a way, this was the most horrible experience that I could have ever put Michelle through because Michelle got a phone call from the police to say that they had found me unconscious. Um, I'd been taken to, to hospital and they were going to arrange for her to go down but warned her that I might not be alive by the time she got there. That's how ill I was. So for Michelle to move from not even knowing that I'd got a mental illness to suddenly being told, I've just tried to kill myself, for her, um, an awful, awful experience. And, uh, and I really am sorry that um, I put her through that. So, so Jeremy, can I just sort of jump in and just ask, you said you, you'd taken antidepressants, so you, you'd been to your GP and, and got the antidepressants, but you even hid that from, from Michelle? I did. Um, I got the first batch of um, uh, antidepressants um, privately um, for a, um, a consultant that I'd seen privately, um, and then repeat prescriptions were um, uh, dispensed by the GP. But yeah, because if I let Michelle know that I was taking antidepressants, I would have to explain to her, well, yeah, actually, I'm ill. And then it would be, well, why didn't you tell me years ago? Um, and so in a way, it was easier just to keep the facade going, um, but a very expensive uh, cost. Um, in hospital, do you know what? I've never ever known what treatment I received that night, and I've never asked, don't want to know. Um, all I am aware of is that in my con unconscious hours, the blackness that I could see, there was just a chink of light uh, that I was able to focus on, and um, I remember that light just getting brighter and brighter as I started to uh, regain consciousness. Once I was awake, I was then having to explain to Michelle um, everything that had gone on, um, and it was painful. Um, it was very painful for me. It was also exceedingly painful for um, Michelle, because Michelle felt very guilty that she hadn't seen any of the signs, uh, made worse because Michelle was a nurse and felt that she should have been able to see them. But I had become really, really good at hiding them. And she felt guilty, um, anger, anger that I'd been able to do something so drastic and um, felt that I didn't love her enough to be able to explain what was going on in my life. So it was a horrible, horrible time for Michelle. Um, I was ultimately discharged from hospital and so started the road to recovery. Um, and that was a mixture of uh, new medication, um, interventions from the crisis team, psychiatry departments, um, work paid for a course of CBT for me. Um, and CBT has had the most dramatic effect in a positive way on my health and well-being. It was life-changing uh, because I was able to recognize um, the things that were causing me difficulties and challenges in life, being able to understand why they were causing me such hardship and able to put in measures that helped me overcome 
some of those, those barriers. Michelle and I had decided that we wouldn't tell Daniel and Kieran um, about, our, about my suicide attempt because we just felt that at the time they probably wouldn't necessarily understand the concept of suicide. We were also concerned about the impact it might have on their own well-being, their schooling and friendship groups. But you know what, as parents, I don't think we gave Daniel and Karen the credit that they deserve because uh, they'd actually work it out for themselves very soon um, afterwards. But like we kept it a secret from them, they kept it a secret from us, you know, and uh, if only we as people, families, could perhaps be a little bit more trusting and um, open with each other. Do you know what, we might actually save each other um, an awful lot of pain. Um, as I say, the, the CBT was, was life-changing for me and um, it helped me get back into work um, and it helped me deal with another round of redundancy, um, the loss of my father. Um, so it, it's really been very, very powerful. In terms of my mental health today, do you know what? I would say that I'm probably the best I've been in well in over 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, my mental state is really good. Um, I was dis discharged from psychiatric care and I've been medication free now for probably about uh, four years. So all in all, life, life is good. Doesn't mean I don't have bad days. Of course I have bad days. I'm only human. Um, but I do feel better able to um, manage those. And I think in, in hindsight, my biggest regret is that um, I didn't have the courage to talk to anybody about my illness and um, how worthless I felt my life was. And maybe if I'd had that confidence, mm. my life might have taken um, a very different path. But yeah, I, I mean, do... sorry, there's yeah. just a really interesting point because we, I know in one of when I've heard your story before, you talk about some of the reckless behaviour that you were doing, the kind of you yes. didn't care whether or not you lived or died. I, I remember quite um, a powerful thing that you said that at times you would just walk out in, in the road and yeah. you weren't bothered. Um, yeah, there were a few instances of that. I mean, yes, I was drinking to excess. Um, um, if I was driving, um, I would think to myself, if I was on the motorway, I would think how easy it would be just to accelerate up to crazy speeds and then at the appropriate moment, just flick the steering wheel and career off the motorway. And uh, yeah, um, I recall very vividly um, crossing dual carriageways um, not intentionally setting out to kill myself, but just feeling that my life had reached its end, the, the pain was that bad, and if I happened to get struck by a lorry or a car as I crossed the road, do you know what, job done. Um, but at that stage it lacked um, the intention to die. Yeah, yeah that, that, that ambivalence, isn't it? You don't care which way yeah. it's all yeah. of the dying almost isn't it uh, yeah. i'm wondering jeremy because you, you've highlighted a lot of things that you were doing so someone may be looking in, and i know you said you hit this very very well but uh, i sometimes think that this behavior leaks out you know that it, 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 we start to see that distress in someone and we had this conversation not so long ago a week ago we were thinking about what if someone had asked you and this is an interesting, what if someone had asked you, Jeremy, what, what, what's happened? Are you thinking of suicide? What do you think your response would have been? I always find this a very difficult question to answer because I think the truth of the matter is, is that society generally has come on leaps and bounds in terms of mental illness and suicide awareness compared with how ill I was sort of 10, 15, 20 years ago. And I do recall, going back to the example of um, walking across the dual carriageways, 
uh, a colleague from work actually asked me, are you trying to kill yourself? Uh, but it was very easy to discount it because I felt it was a, an off the cuff glib comment, not meant seriously. And so it was very easy to uh, ignore it. And also she didn't follow it up, you know, because we, we teach that you ask once and if you still think something's not right, ask again and ask again. Um, and that didn't happen. But I like to think that if I was in that position now and somebody asked me, you know, are you thinking of uh, killing yourself? Um, I would like to think that I would be more willing to open up. Mm. The very fact that somebody's recognized that I'm not right, I might see as this person might be able to help me. Mm. Not necessarily That's... cure me, but just give that moment of support. I think that's great what what you're saying there, Jeremy, in terms of how society's changed. Uh, in in a lot of the training that we deliver, we talk about stigma and the impact that this sort of this sense of shame and disgrace around mental health problems, how that exists um, within people, and it's two it's it's got two edges to it, hasn't it? It's got the stigma around society and the stigma that the individual feels about themselves, and it sounds like that's what was going on for you. Um, I, I think so, um, because I felt completely wretched um, about the situation that I found myself in. Um, I convinced myself that people wouldn't understand. Um, I convinced myself that I was beyond hope. Um, and um, yeah, but as I say, I think one of the important things for people to realise is that the intention was not for me to die. The intention for me was for the pain to stop because I felt in so much pain day and night. Um, it was relentless. Um, and death by suicide was the way of bringing that pain to an end. I think that's an important thing for people to recognize, isn't it? That it, it isn't about, it's not about dying, it's about a, an ending of pain. And that's yeah. what very often wants they just want the cessation of that pain that they're feeling uh, I'm always moved by listening to you Jeremy, I, I really am I notice I'm, I'm reaching for water because it's almost like there's a tension there I've got a dry mouth because it is so powerful to hear about your, your story and your experience how common your experience is your experience, but how common is this? I mean, I know we said at the big, very beginning. What's your awareness of the, the sort of how common these thoughts and feelings are for people? I think one of the things that um, has struck me um, in delivering these talks is how many times so, uh, people have contacted me afterwards and said, I've either been feeling like that myself or I know somebody that's died by suicide, or I've had a family member um, that's gone through a suicide. Um, and I think what strikes me is the number of people that are impacted um, by suicide in um, one way or another. Um, the person that dies, um, the people that, the immediate people that are left behind, um, friends, relationships, colleagues, associates, um, the, the ripple effect of um, death by suicide is uh, quite staggering, really. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like the, the man who runs the, the news agent, um, I stopped going to the news agent to buy the paper, and then he finds out a few days later that I died by suicide. It has an impact. You know, so um, I, I'm struck by how many people will say, I've got a connection to what you're talking about. And, and yet, isn't this absolutely fascinating, though, because we have something that uh, I think many of us, the people listening in, into this webinar, may have been impacted upon by a suicide. I know people who've suicided. Um, 
Mm. Yeah, it's, it's one of those hidden things. It's, it's like we can't say the word. And I, I spent some time on, on, on training, getting people to say the word sort of suicide and, and think about asking that question. Are you having thoughts of suicide? Are you having thoughts about taking your life? And I'm taken back. I, I often think about, like, do you remember Les Dawson? Uh, 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 he used to do Ida and um, Cross the Fence. Yes, and yeah. Map of the words. It's like, I, I, and it's like we can't say the word, yet it is so common. You know, it is not an unusual experience for people to have some of these thoughts and feelings, yet it remains hidden. It remains not talked yeah. about. I think, I think there's a couple of reasons why that is the, the case. I think people are fearful that if they ask somebody, are you thinking of um, killing yourself, that they will actually plant the seed. Yeah. Um, but that is known not to be true because if there is a seed the seed is already there you can't plant the seed in that person's mind and i think the other the other barrier that people have is the fear of if a person tells me yes they are what do i do you know and a bit of a bit of panic sets in um but you know at the end of the day all they need to do is just demonstrate that um, they've heard the person say, yes, actually, I am thinking of killing myself. And you're not there to cure the person. You're just to, there to lend them, extend a hand to them and say, let me take you from this dark place to this place of safety. And together we'll work out how we might be able to do that. I'm really struck by what you're saying in terms of um honesty, open communication, and the, the, the number of people and the number of organisations that are out there, once it becomes out in the open, you know, the, the help from your GP sounds like it was fairly positive. The crisis teams, the psychiatrist, the fact that you were able to access CBT that you described as life-changing. And I always say other therapies are available because yeah. the CBT won't work for everyone, but there are therapies available that people can access. Um, I think about that Jahari's window thing, you know, I don't know whether you've come across that. We don't know what we don't know until we kind of need to find out about it. Yeah. And yeah. Then, it was almost like you was, perhaps weren't aware of the amount of help and support that was available before this started to happen. Or were you? I mean, were you all in, in sort of avoiding it, perhaps? I don't know that I necessarily avoided it um, because I, I had been to a doctor and was taking medication. Um, I think there was an element of um, the illness preventing me maybe from seeking um, other other help. The help wasn't always readily available um, because the waiting time for CBT back in 2010 on the NHS, you were looking for about a, an 18 month waiting list. So I, I was very fortunate that uh, my employer at the time was uh, willing to fund um, CBT for me that I then got immediately. So I, I, I was very, very fortunate. Um, and as you say, that there are other therapies available, um, but they're not always available at the right time. And when people, when people need them, um, referrals to um, points of uh, crisis, the crisis teams, you know, sadly, the situation is they don't happen instantly. And there are, are those time delays. Um, and I think it's an issue that, as society, we need to address. Yes, I, I, and I'm wondering if there's something in this, Jeremy, about there's points along that continuum, along that journey that you had where it might not have got to the point of you taking 
are, are attempting to take your own life. If we could have helped with early intervention, noticing, and, and maybe yeah. someone sort of pinning you down a little bit more and kind of going, oh, Jerry, things aren't right for you. I've noticed you're doing this, this, and this, and, and that asking once and asking again, if that could have helped. Um, may, maybe it could have done, um, Simon. Um, bearing in mind I had lived many, many years in um, a state of denial and suppressing mm. to the outside world what was what was going on. And there was a belief that people wouldn't understand, people didn't care. Um, and um, maybe had people persevered more mm. with uh, their questioning um, and explained why they thought, Jeremy, look, you look disheveled. You're not your normal self. You normally mm. used to dress uh, much smarter than you. You haven't shaved for a few days. You're, not, you're, you're looking a bit rough. What's going on? Yeah, but I think um, that's what's going on is really important. What's happening in, in someone's life yeah. that might be making them, that them feel that way. Yeah, it's... it's hmm. But um, interesting um, because um, obviously my suicide attempt became very public knowledge um, and on the whole the reactions to the suicide attempt um, very very supportive from the majority of people in the sense that they were shocked um, but were there ready to um, lend a hand of support, not just to me, but to Michelle also. And uh, But there were a couple of people who um, didn't help by their, their reaction. Um, a colleague at work um, did call me a selfish bastard uh, mm. for putting Michelle through the trauma of the, the suicide attempt. And another individual who we thought was a close family friend um, when I told him of my suicide attempt, the conversation finished, and I've never heard from him since. Mm. You know, um, and I find that strange. And it hurt at the time. Um, and it would be great to be able to have that conversation with him, um, a to explain what went on, but b to try and understand um, his own reaction to my suicide attempt. Yeah, and I think that is an important point as well. People have such a range of responses, sort of their thinking, what they feel around this, their own sort of judgments. Um, and, and it's interesting that we try and get people to sort of set aside their own judgments around this and, and try to empathize with what's actually happening with the individual. You know, I might not agree with suicide, but I can start to understand what got that person to the point of feeling that way and recognising that pain. Yeah. Um, and, and there were interesting facets that came out um, uh, during and as part of my uh, recovery. Um, as you might expect, um, with a, a good Irish name like Codwire, not unreasonable to um, assume that uh, I, I was brought up as a Catholic, um, and indeed I was. And yet, um, post suicide attempt, when I went to speak to the clergy about it, um, I really found them completely dismissive. Right. They, they they didn't know how to deal with it. it um, I think it's really they, interesting, uh, Jeremy. I'm just conscious, like, like like a little shepherd's crook that's come onto the stage. That, uh, because I, I get lost in the conversation with you, so my apologies for this. It's my doing, but I think this is interesting in terms of some cultural things and where people are at with this. Yeah. To start, all we can do, I think, is is start to become more aware of it. And, yeah. and the fact that you are here for me is just incredibly important because it it is showing that. There is recovery. You know, this is possible and likely if, if we intervene, if we get someone the help that that yeah. we know is out there and that they need. So I just want to say thank you once again. And apologies, I, I was supposed to keep track of time. 
and we've gone over on that. So, so my apologies for that. And I think there might be some questions from okay. the, the, the audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have uh, had a question come through, but you know, just sort of personally again to say uh, thank you, Jeremy, for you know sharing your insights and your lived experience. I think it's so powerful, you know, to hear it firsthand from someone who you know has been in that, in that situation. And uh, you know, we talked a little earlier, didn't we, before we started the webinar? I think you know, there's there's a lot of us who have been impacted you know by this subject either directly or indirectly and the more we talk about it then the better it can be and the more help we can be for people uh, who need it at the time that they need it and I think for me um, uh, you know having lost a friend to suicide you know <laughs> Mental health illness does not define the person. Uh, and often when you've lost someone in this situation, it, the conversation always becomes about the way that they passed and not about the person they were, you know, uh, and what actually defined them as an individual, which is often something very different from the dark side of them passing. They're often, you know, very beautiful, light, caring people often people who care so much about other people that perhaps they forget to look after themselves sometimes when they need it um we've got a question come in might be able to help us here simon please do stay with us jeremy uh if anyone else has got any questions in general or for jeremy please do uh pop them in the, the box uh and thank you for this person for, for sending in this question do you know anyone who has been impacted by overthinking? Not so much that an individual is in pain, but they can't stop overthinking about situations and how people think of them. Suicide, self-harm then becomes an avenue, not so much to stop the pain, but to just feel something else and think about something else. Yeah. I mean, that, that is, um... The, the short answer to that is yes, I, I, I do know. I, I see that actually, I see overthinking um, in the therapy room sort of ev every week. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of being consumed. I think there, we also see that occurring within um, other behaviour being around self-harm perhaps rather than suicide that actually shifts the focus of that person's thinking onto something else. Um, suicide um, is about this is so intolerable this overthinking is so intolerable I want a cessation of, of that what I would say to that individual that there is lots of stuff out there in terms of helping people with overthinking uh, CBT is a great one, actually. Jeremy kind of yes, nodding there. Jeremy, I think a lot of work goes on in terms of where people's cognitions are, where their thoughts are, and how they are overthinking and the jumbling of, of, of thoughts. And I would also suggest something along the lines of mindfulness and approaching mindfulness and a mindful way of being. Yep. So we become more alert to our thinking rather than be consumed by our, our thinking. And we're curious about that. And that can be something that can can help. So, so the short answer is yes. I am very much aware of the, the impact of overthinking, and 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 that. And I think we all, well, I we all. I'm going to own up. I do a lot of overthinking at times when I'm stressed. I know that it's, it's like the thoughts just pour into my head. And Jeremy, I'm guessing the same thing happens to you still. That there will be times when you, you, your stress container is full, and, and Tracy, it will happen to you. Oh, it's a jumble of thoughts, and so that mindful approach to being can actually really help with that. I hope that answers that, that question. Yeah, I've got someone here saying thank you, Jeremy, for sharing your story. And you know, what things do you do now in your everyday life to? You know try and keep yourself on track so what sort of things work for you um 
I do practice the CBT. Um, it has, the CBT has become a very natural part of my day-to-day -day living. It doesn't mean that I overanalyze every situation that I'm faced with, but mm -hmm. I, I do ask myself the question, if I'm faced with a situation where it could be a bit awkward, stressful, I ask myself, what's the worst that can happen? And when I think about what's the worst that can happen, the reality is invariably far better than my worst fears. Um, and so the, the practice of CBT, the practice of mindfulness, um, have all become um, an important part of my day-to-day -day living. And just going back to the, the overthinking, I mean, I, I'm still very, very guilty of that. Um, mm -hmm. Most most of my ideas, uh, my creative ideas, come to me in the middle of the night, and and I think about them, and I think, and I think, and I think, and it reaches the stage. I drive my wife mad because I finish up having to get up at about half past three, quarter to four in the morning, to go and do something with those um, thoughts because it's the only way I can manage to stop overthinking. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think it'd be fair to say there's a, you know, a lot of people who have that overthinking in the middle uh, of the night and uh, you know, I have mechanisms to try and cope with that, whether it is getting out of bed and doing something or whether it's having a pen and a piece of paper next to your bed and just offloading those and parking them uh, to the morning if you can and, and other such strategies. I think it's really um, sorry, Trish, I was just gonna say I think it's really interesting because I have a I have a um notebook by my bed. And so if I get a thought I, I think of Harry Potter, you know where they take the thought out of the head with the wand and yes. put it on the on the thing. Kind of do that. I think one of the things is to make sure that you respond to that list in the morning. Because I think mine's mine, mine's just that do your tax return down for about <laughs> 15 times on the thing, I'm still not doing it. So there's something going on there about doing that that active response to that thought in that time. Getting it out of your head, putting it on paper, but then actually acting on it when you have the time to do it. I think there's, there's, also, there's also one other um, important aspect of um, the kind of self-care, um, and that is just feeling better about myself that I am not ashamed um, of my my history, um, either the mental illness or the suicide attempt. It is something that happened. Um, and so recognizing that I don't feel ashamed by it and being able to talk about it in a more uh, positive and constructive way, um, I think is also a, a useful useful way of living. And do you get a sense, Jeremy, that things are changing around uh, the openness and willingness of people to have conversations around mental health? Do you get a sense of that? Uh, they are, yeah, and, and they have changed and improved significantly over the last five, ten years, in part down to employers taking a much more proactive role and encouraging employees to um, be more open about mental health conversations, um, putting support strategies in place, running campaigns like it's okay not to be okay, um, ask once, ask twice. Um, I think employers have had the biggest impact of all um, because it's reached a stage where I think employers recognize the value and the contribution that their employees can make to the success of a business. And by looking after their employees, it's a win-win situation for everybody. But for me, employers have had the biggest impact. That's really good. Sorry, I was just struck by something that you said there, Jeremy, because I, I, I wonder about, about this. And it goes back to our conversation uh, the other day, really. Uh, this idea of it's okay to be not okay. I kind of slightly disagree with that, you know, because it, it's rubbish to be not okay. It's really horrible 
to be not okay. But it's okay to say that you're not okay. Yeah. And it's that response and that communication that you get that people accept that you're not feeling okay and they want to help. And you feel confident to be able to say to someone, actually, I'm having a really rough day today. I'm feeling absolutely ghastly. And for that person to go, right, what's happened? Let's talk about it. Yep, yeah. And, and that way we've been working right. on the idea of not being okay to feeling confident and comfortable about who we are and, and saying that. I think yeah, as well, okay. you know, we live, um, we live very busy lives, everything's so fast paced and and actually, you know, to take a moment, you know, to ask for a second time or actually to live in the moment and actually realise what someone is saying, not just verbally, but also in their mannerisms, it, it, it asks of us all to just slow down a little bit and actually to take that time. There's yeah. a programme that, and, and again, I know Jeremy does something similar. We talk about sort of invitations and, and picking up on some very subtle signs. If someone sort of says, oh, you know, I've had enough, what do they mean by that? And when you put that next to the other things that someone is doing, so we don't dismiss it, we move towards that. And you started this, Tracy, by saying this is about a courageous conversation. This is about not being frightened of what might come back if we say, what's happened? You mm -hmm. said that, you can't take it anymore, you've had enough. What's going on, what's happened? You know, really encouraging that and taking the time. It's it's an interesting point also that you don't actually necessarily have to know um, the person uh, where you sense that there is a, a, a problem. Um, there is a very good documentary worth um, uh, researching and, and watching. Um, it's called Stranger on the Bridge. Mm. And very, very simply and quickly, um, a guy was going to wor work one morning in London, crossing London Bridge. He saw somebody sitting on the uh, wrong side of the bridge. Didn't know the guy from Adam, but he went to him and asked him, are you okay? And the guy replied, well, actually, no, I'm not really okay. The stranger managed to get him back on the other side, the proper side of the bridge. Uh, the police had arrived by this time, the two separated. But years later, um, the guy that he saved put an appeal out on television looking for the guy that had saved him. And uh, they were reunited. And hence, a documentary was made um, about charting their meeting and what happened. But I think one of the beauties of the, the documentary is it demonstrates the fact you don't need to know the person. If you see a sign that something isn't right, doesn't matter that you don't know them, still ask. Powerful. I, I, I came back to my car once and someone was sat in the car next to me or by the car next to me in plus the team. I didn't need to know that person at all other than I could see that they were in distress and mm -hmm. asking what was going on. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you again, uh, Jeremy, for joining us and, and Simon as well. I think that's been really helpful and insightful. And again, we'd say if this has affected anybody today, please do reach out to someone, speak to your GP. There's fantastic charities out there. Samaritans Mind is a fantastic charity as well. And we do have a really great employee assistance programme here at Suez uh, called We Care. So what are we going to uh, be looking at and talking uh, to next week? Well, uh, next week uh, we're going to be talking about Alzheimer's. Um, on the 21st of September, it's Alzheimer's Awareness Day. And we've invited along experts to dispel some myths around the disease and explain more about the condition. As well in, as learning more about Alzheimer's, You'll, find, you'll be able to find out how you can get a diagnosis and where you can get support from as well. So that's next Friday at the normal time of 10 o'clock. In the meantime, thank you everybody for joining us and uh, Jeremy and I wish you and your wife Michelle all the very best for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.